You know, my opinion about the pastor was rising up. My, even in the toilet. Even the toilet is a holy place. My God. These people are really people of the word. You know, in the kitchen, even in the kitchen. Everywhere there are scriptures. So I thought the pastor's wife, when she's cooking, she's just meditating the scriptures and cooking. So I thought, my God, what a family. So, after all my exalted opinion, was honest exalted opinion about the family. And uh, after all this uh, tea and the biscuits, uh, this usual thing, you know, we knelt down to pray. So there's a tradition in India, you don't immediately pray. You first sing two songs. And after singing two songs, you have to read a chapter of the Bible. These are all traditions that should not be broken. So after reading the scriptures, time to pray. Now, as the scriptures were being read by the pastor, I was just closing my eyes and pondering my heart. I was telling the Lord, Lord, what a holy family this family is. I told the Lord all about the scriptures in the toilet, in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, as I was saying that, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing outside the house, even outside the compound. And I looked at the Lord and I asked him, what are you doing there, Lord, when you should be inside the house? And the Lord looked at me and he asked me, what are you doing there when I am outside? <laughs> I was shocked. I said, Lord, what do you mean? Why are you standing outside? And the Lord told me, all the scriptures that you see on the walls, they are only on the walls. Their hearts are far away from the scriptures they proclaim to follow. So therefore, I have rejected them what are you doing there? Get up and come out. So, I looked at my associate, the, the, the friend who brought me to the house. I told him, okay, you, I'm leaving. You can just finish the prayer. <laughs> you know, in India, for a person of my caliber to say such thing or to do such thing, is a great problem. It's a great thing. It's a very serious offense. And I just got up and I just walked out. And that boy told the pastor, what happened? And the pastor began to shiver. And he got real scared and he came running after me, asked me, what's the problem? So briefly I told him the problem and he pleaded me, please come and pray for our repentance. I said, I can't do that. Because the Lord told me to come out of your house. Don't laugh. This is serious. What if this happens to you? So why are you laughing? This is not a joke. This is not a comedy. If the Lord does not stay in your house, now what if this is happening to you? Will you be laughing? You'll be on your face crying. So why are you laughing? Is it because this happened in India? No, that's the wrong thing you did. And the pastor came running after me, pleading and pleading and pleading. And I said, I can't do anything because what good am I without the Lord Jesus? I am just an empty vessel. I am who I am because of the Lord Jesus. You are receiving me because of the Lord Jesus. If not for the Lord Jesus, you wouldn't even, Pastor David wouldn't be inviting me here. Right, Pastor? See, even he shakes his head in agreement. You know, all external form of religion is nothing if you are not living a holy life. You are just like what the scripture says. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. What does that mean? You have an external form of godliness. The power is 
holiness. That's what sets us apart from a godly Hindu, from a godly Muslim, from a godly Buddhist. The thing that sets us apart is the life of holiness. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, God is cleansing his church. So you must put your life right. You know, when the fires of God comes, it will do one of two things. It will either purify you or it will kill you. That's what happened to the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. The fires of God came and killed them because they offered strange fire before God. You know what they were doing? They were playing games. That's what they did. They intruded into an office that is not theirs. They were doing something that they were not called to do. When you're not called, you don't assume the call. You don't presume the call. The work of God is not like any other profession. Where you go to a school, get a degree or a diploma, and then you apply for a job, and then you get paid to do the job. This ministry is not like that. The scripture says, except one is called like Aaron. No one can take upon himself dishonor. Of course, many do this as a profession. At the end of the month, they get a big fat salary from the church. It's a profession to them. That's not a true minister of God. A true minister's paycheck comes from heaven. Amen. Not from the church. The God is your employer. Not the church, not the committee. So the committee does not have the last say. God has the last say. So all such churches that are playing games, they'll all be washed away by the Spirit of the Lord that will come like a flood in these last days. The flood, it will come like a flood and just wash all houses of mockeries or game houses, will wash them all away. Now again, Two things will happen when the Spirit of the Lord comes. It will fill a genuine church, a genuine believer, a genuine minister of God with the seven spirits of God. Second, it will come like a flood and wash away all those who make a mockery of the works of God and the things of God. So you decide today where your destiny will be. You have to decide where you want to walk. For God is going to visit this place very soon. Your prayer is going to be answered very soon. I will explain more in detail tomorrow. So the women are going to be persecuted. Now the next group, nursing mothers. Why the Lord Jesus said, the breasts that don't feet are blessed because there's going to come a time you can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast revelation chapter 13 verses 16 and 17 says when you cannot buy and sell how are you going to feed your newborn babies if the mother runs out of her breast milk or she's malnutrient Nutritionist, nutritionized, she can't produce milk. How are you going to feed your babies? Can you bear the screams of your baby? You can control the hunger pangs in your stomach. A mother can do that, a father can do that. You are adult. But can you stop your ears from the cries and the screaming cries of your newborn baby? or your grandchild. 
You cannot. Are you going to see your newborn baby cry and cry and cry to death of hunger? Now this is going to happen. You cannot buy or sell. What will you do? Are you going to take the mark of the beast so that you can buy milk for your baby and then hope that God understands? You know, let me tell you another truth. There are many, many people who are going to make that fatal mistake in that day, fooling themselves, deceiving themselves into thinking God will understand. If I take the mark, he will understand me. He knows that I was forced to. He knows that I didn't want to, but I have to. The scriptures very clearly says in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 11, any one who takes the mark of the beast will perish in hell forever and forever. The Bible says in un, no unmistakable manner. The moment you take it, no matter how genuine excuse you may have, no matter how much you are forced, surely the Antichrist will force you. Surely the laws of the land that will be enacted in those days will make it very difficult to force you. It will force you. That's what the scripture says. The false prophet will force you to worship the beast. The Antichrist government will force you to take the mark of the beast. You have to take so that you can become citizens of the one world government. Just like you have a social security number today, you'll be given a new social security number. And this number is for everyone on this earth. One unique number for everybody. And by the way, that number is not 666. Because the Bible says very clearly, here is wisdom. He who is wise, let him count the number. And the number is 666. You see, if the number is 666, you don't need wisdom to look at it and know it's 666. Any stupid person <laughs> knows by looking at 666, they know it's 666. Right? You don't need a college diploma for that. Even with kindergarten education is enough to know three sixes. But the scripture says, here is wisdom. Let him who is wise discern. Let him who is wise decode. So which means it's a hidden number. It's a code of numbers. When they are decoded, it will total up to triple six. So, which means the whole world, now the most of the Christian world are looking only for 666. And when the real mark of the beast comes, you will end up taking because it is not 666. See, that is why it is very, very important to have the gift of the discernings of spirits. You must have the gift. You must pray and ask the Lord to fill you with the gift of discernings of spirit so that in whatever form, when the mark comes, you will know this is the mark. You will have the wisdom. The second people group that will be persecuted, Matthew chapter 24 verse 9 tells us are the believers. Now look at Matthew chapter 24 verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. There are four things in this scripture. Number one, they will deliver you. The word deliver you in the Greek means put you in prison. Number two, Tribulation. The word tribulation in the Greek means 
sufferings, mental anguish or pressure put on you that will cost you mental anguish. Thirdly, the word kill in Greek means to kill outrightly or to kill you very slowly. Number four, hated. In the Greek it means to love less, to detest, to persecute. These are the four things that are going to happen to the general believers at large. That includes all of us. You will be hated, you will be killed, you will be suffering and you will be put in prison. Now if you read Acts chapter 8 verse 3, before Paul became Paul, when he was still Saul, now this is what he did. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. What happened in the first century will be repeated again in these last days. Now, by the way, Saul was not a heathen. He was a Jew, a very high-ranking Jew of the Sanhedrin Council. In today's standard, Saul had a PhD degree in theology and he was a disciple of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the most highly educated theologian of that time. So that shows us that even religious leaders will persecute you. Amen. You will be betrayed by your own leader who has become a son or daughter of Satan. And your leader will be one of those who is a wolf in sheep's clothing. They are all over the world now. Wolves false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, false pastors, wolves in sheep's clothing. Just like what Saul did, these false ones will drag you out. They will single you out. Now let me give you a few examples from the Bible of some precedents. The Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 26 to 27, that the prophet Micaiah was put in prison. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 7 to 10, the seer Hanani, he was put in prison. In Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 6 to 12, the prophet Jeremiah himself was cast into a dungeon and then imprisoned there. In Acts chapter 5, verse 18, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ were put in prison. Acts chapter 12, verses 2 to 5, Peter was put in prison. Acts chapter 16, verse 23, Paul and Silas were in prison. So you see a precedence there in the first century and in the Old Testament and even in modern church history. Believers been put in prison. So what happened in the past is going to be repeated again. Next, the next group of people who will be persecuted, the ministers of God. They will be persecuted and killed. Matthew chapter 10 verse 17, Luke chapter 21 verse 12. People will kill true ministers of God and they will claim that they are doing God's will. If you read John chapter 16 verse 2, the Lord Jesus said, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. Acts chapter 9 verse 1 and 2 tells us, Saul did it. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37 tells us the prophet Isaiah 
was sawn in two by King Manasseh. Matthew chapter 14 verses 3 to 10 tells us that John the Baptist was put in prison and then beheaded. And church history tells us the Apostle Paul was beheaded in Rome. And Thomas, we know from church history in India, he was speared and killed in India. So we have precedents from biblical history that ministers of God were persecuted and killed. And not only history, even in modern church history. I'm sure you have heard about how many pastors in Russia, communist Russia and communist China were brutally killed. Women ministers of God raped before the very eyes of their husbands. You know, Catholic nuns in India, they've been stripped of their clothes and made to walk fully naked all the entire streets and the whole villages looking at them and mocking at them. This just happened a few years ago in India and it still happens today. Now, why will this take place? We read from Revelation chapter 13 that the false prophet will enforce a new religion or will create a new religion called the one world religion. And this one world religion will compose of the good of all the religions in the world. They'll take one bit of everything and they'll put together that will proclaim the Antichrist as the Messiah. You know, two years ago, we were in Sydney, Australia for a conference. And one morning as I was praying, the Lord Jesus appeared to me and he spoke to me about the false prophet who is going to come. For 30 minutes, the Lord explained to me about all the identification of the false prophet and then he said, the Pope Francis is the false prophet. And he said, now you preach it. You know, most of our financial supporters, our partners in India are Catholics. 75% of our partners are Catholics. So I debated before the Lord, what shall I do now? How am I going to say that the Pope is now the false prophet? So what will happen to all our contributors? They all are going to get offended and they all are going to pull back. And what will happen to our works? And the Lord told me this, I am your provider. You just say what I tell you to say. So on a live telecast, I preach on this. About the false prophets who was going to come. And you know what happened to us? Our income went up. Except for two Catholics who were offended, no other Catholic were offended. They only wrote and told me, thank you for opening our eyes. Now, this, the Lord showed me two years ago. Just two weeks ago, the Pope put out a video blog proposing a one world religion. Just this happened two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Have you seen that? Now her proposal, he is now proposing for the one world religion. When I saw that, it confirmed what the Lord revealed two years ago. That this is the false prophet. Now he's already here. Who appears like a very benign person. Who embraces everybody. Now, remember... I want you to understand one thing. If the false prophet is here, it also means the Antichrist is also here. He's also here. And they know each other. So only God is holding them back. You know why? 
because the church is not ready for your sake he's holding it back see how good he is how kind God is that doesn't mean he will wait forever there is a time for that for the curtains to come down my dearly beloved brothers and sisters the Bible says very clearly time will delay no longer now why will such persecution how will such persecution take place the Bible tells us in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 that perilous times will come in the last days how what will cause these perilous times or what is the result of the perilous times the mindset of society will change drastically they will become more evil than the people in the days of Noah second Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 5 details to us in various order how society will change they will become boasters they will become lovers of themselves they'll become lovers of money they'll become proud they'll become blasphemous disobedient to parents unthankful unholy unloving unforgiving slanderous without self-control brutal despises of good traitors headstrong haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God this will be the attitude of society in the last days now you already see all this haven't you yes. don't you yes. what you are seeing now is the tip of the iceberg it's not the whole iceberg the whole iceberg will reach will surface itself in these last days little by little the iceberg will become above the waters as such they will begin to betray and hate one another Matthew chapter 24 verse 10 tells us family members and relations will turn against each other Luke chapter 21 verse 16 the father not safe the or the mother not safe the husband not safe or the wife not safe either one will take the mark of the beast and they will turn on you children not safe parents may be safe the children may take the mark they will turn on you your enemies will be your own household see that is why it is very very important to pray your whole family to salvation before that time before that time get your family safe don't give it to chance enforce godliness in your homes Amen. it is required Amen. godliness begins in your house you have to put your foot down and say this is the standard of godliness this is the standard of holiness the father and the mother has the right You know, there lived a wonderful prophetess of God called Gwen Shaw. How many of you have heard of her? She was a very dear friend of mine. And she once shared her testimony. When she became a teenager, she was very rebellious. Like all, most teenagers go through that walk of rebellion. And she would not want to go to church on Sundays. So she would just tell her, Papa, I don't feel like going to church today. And you know what her father says to her? I don't care whether you feel like going to church or not, as long as you stay under my roof. You are going to church. And she testifies that it's because of her father's discipline, she became who she was. The father put his foot down, say, as long as you are under my roof, you will obey my rules. There's no such thing as you will not go to church. There's no such thing. Now she turned out to be a great woman of God through whom God raised up hundreds and thousands of women who shook America 
and even many nations of the world. And she lived up to a right old age of 80 plus something before she was called home to the Lord. So the parents, father and mother, have a very vital role to shape the destiny of your children. Their destiny is in your hands. You know, I have four nephews and two nieces. My third nephew was born in our home and my mother brought him up when he was a small baby. And from the day he was born, I have been seeing him. <clears throat> now when he was about a year old, when he could crawl, so every morning he has his feeding bottle in his mouth and he will crawl into my room. And I will be having my cup of tea and I will be reading the word. So he will sit right beside me and he will drink his bottle of milk and I will have my cup of tea. So when I when I'm done with my tea, he'll be done with his smoke. Then I make him sit on my lap and I'll teach him the word. I said, repeat after me. So I'll, I repeat word for word. And in his baby language, he will repeat those words. So I helped him to repeat. And every day, we go through one chapter of the Bible. And then after that, it's time to pray. So I'll tell him, now let's kneel down. So this little boy will kneel down. And I will hold him up. Because you know they can kneel down for long. I will be praying for two hours. So this boy have to kneel with me for two hours. So I will hold up his hands. I said now let us sing songs unto God. I trained my nephew like that. You know for four years before I moved out. Today that boy is serving God in the ministry. There, there are a lot of godly values inside him because of the seed that was planted in him when he was a toddler. So the, the seeds that you sow into your children, the Bible says, cast your bread upon the waters. After many days, you will find it. So it's very, very important for parents to shape the destiny of your children. Laws will be enacted in the land to persecute, to imprison, and to kill believers. Three kinds of laws are going to be set up. Number one, a law will be enacted that will force the worship of an idol. In Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, you'll read how Nebuchadnezzar made a huge statue of himself and demanded the, all the people in the Babylonian Empire consisting of 120 provinces that stretch from Egypt all the way up to India and forced them to worship the idol. In the same manner, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13 verses 14 to 15 that an idol will be made for the Antichrist and people all over the world will be forced to bow down your knees and worship this idol. Number two, a law will be made to forbid prayer. Not just prayer, prayer to the true living God. In Daniel chapter 6, Verses 6 to 9, it happened during the times of Daniel, where a law was enacted that nobody should pray to any other God for 30 days. Why only 30 days? See, a law should be forever, right? Why only 30 days? Because that law was aimed at one person. Not the whole, every citizen in Babylon only one person who is a holy prophet of God. So laws will be enacted in the land against Christians. 
that will forbid prayer. Now, among all the nations of the world, America is very familiar with such a law because in the US, prayer is forbidden in the schools, right? Prayer is forbidden in the schools, prayer is forbidden even in many public places. You can't read the Bible in a school. You cannot just sit in one corner and read your Bible, which is an offense. You cannot even pray during lunch break. It is an offense. You know, America is the only country in the world that has such laws. Even a heathen country like India does not forbid a person to read Bible in the school. Do you know that? Two Christian kids can pray during lunch break in a school in India. He doesn't forbid that. Even in a Muslim country, they don't forbid you to read the Bible. A supposedly Christian nation like the US. I'm sorry to say this. Once upon a time, America was godly, but not now. You agree? Yes. Not now. This nation is not a Christian nation now. It was once upon a time, but not now. Now she is becoming more ungodly than a Hindu nation or a Muslim nation or a Buddhist nation. You have embraced all the Hindu gods that we rejected. You have embraced all the Buddhist gods that they have rejected. You have embraced, you know, when you opened your nation and allowed the Muslim immigrants to come, what have you done? You have welcomed terrorists in your country. And that's what Mr. Trump is trying to do. Kick them all out back. But look at what the government is trying to do. See, look at what your Supreme Court is trying to do. They are trying to prevent him from doing godly acts. That's the truth. Amen. Amen. You know, there is a diabolical satanic group that has been set up and they are fasting and praying against your president. Last year, when I was in Lancaster, the word of the Lord came unto me and said, ask the American people to set up a 24-7 presidential prayer watch to focus prayer only for the president. Because he needs the prayers of the saints to surround him and protect him from the arrows that will come against him from all ungodly sources. Every one of you have now heard this. It is your moral responsibility to pray for your president. Like what I told you on the first day, Mr. Donald Trump was voted into office against all odds because heaven willed it. And why haven't we did? Because you are given a last chance. A last chance for this nation to turn back to righteousness. And Mr. Trump is like a godly man standing between God's judgment and the nation. 
He's like the man standing in the gap. He's like the prophet Moses holding the hands of God. Because you didn't do it. So God in his great mercy raised up a man like Cyrus and made him stand in the gap. Now all this is the God is God's graceful acts of kindness for you. His graceful acts of kindness because he sought for a man who will stand in the gap but he found none. There were none. So he raised up a man, one man, to come and stand in the gap. So that through him standing in the gap, four years of grace for you. One term is four years, right? Four years of grace for you. And you need to put your house in order during the four years. Now why you should pray for your president? Because he must last his term. Yes. If he's kicked out for any reason or killed or he himself forced to resign then your grace spirit is cut. Now this is serious. The American believers must take this seriously. You should not Take this lightly and just leave this place forgetting about the whole thing. President Trump is God's last man of grace for you. Last opportunity of grace for you. And just like how Dr. Bruce shared last night about the solar eclipse and his movement and spiritual application. Now if it is a symbol of judgment and then if it is focused only on the US, and then he remember he said that it first begins at a city called government point the government point points to the white house it will begin there so you must form a prayer watch called the presidential prayer watch and focus prayer only for your president two or three of you gather together Pray only for your president. Set up a prayer watch that will pray 24 hours, each person taking half an hour a day. It is possible to be done. A church can do with all thousands of people. One person here, one person there, praying half an hour a day. Not much. You can cover the whole 24 hours praying for your president. Now, if he goes down, this nation goes down. Then you will face the full fury of the judgments of God. What has been withheld so far will now be released upon this nation. Time will delay no longer. You know, I was very scared when yesterday morning when I was called to the council, when they said, we are going to deliberate, decisions are going to be made about the US. I was very scared because I know about some of the destinies about the US. It was shown to me past several years. For all the sins that are going on in this nation, it's a miracle you're still alive. I think the word miracle is not the right word. You are alive simply because of the grace of God. You know, two years ago, when the Supreme Court passed the same-sex marriage bill in this nation, I was in Houston for a three days of meeting. Before leaving, before coming to Houston, we were in Los Angeles airport, waiting to catch a flight to come to Houston. And when I was standing in the queue to board the plane, 
I, I saw a mighty angel stand on my right side and he had a sledge hammer in his hand and I looked at him and I asked him what are you doing here and he said I am the angel of this city and when he spoke those words I saw him standing this is something very miraculous you know I saw him standing in two place at the same time he was standing beside me with a height of about eight feet and he was standing outside the airport you know in Los Angeles airport there is this curve like restaurant he was standing out there and he was so huge taller than that structure the icon structure of Los Angeles airport and he had a sledgehammer in his hand and he said we are going to strike this city with an earthquake and he said all my angels are lining up all along the coast of California and they are waiting for my command to strike this nation and then he also said the angels have been positioned in three places in this nation to strike earthquake three places one is California and I don't know where the other two are I think one is in the center in the center of the US and I shivered and I trembled why such catastrophe all during the flight from Los Angeles to Houston I was praying profusely for the US and I didn't know why such a disastrous judgment is being pronounced and when I came out of the plane and I stepped foot in Houston and I heard the voice of the Lord say this city will be flooded I said oh my look I'm only I don't get good news I'm only getting bad news all the time and I didn't know why I'm getting hearing all this until that night the other speaker for the conference was Pastor Joseph Sweet from Lancaster and when we met for dinner the first thing he asked me was did you saw the news I said no I didn't what was in the news he said the Supreme Court just passed the same-sex marriage bill and you know as soon as the Supreme Court passed the bill who was the first person to send a congratulatory message your former president Obama he was the first person to send a tweet the Supreme Court has made the right decision and instantly the White House was lighted up with the seven rainbow colors of the LGBT community you know the White House see it's supposed to be a white house a house that represents holiness and what has it become a house of Sodom and Gomorrah so if God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah why shouldn't he destroy you tell me why why shouldn't he destroy you I was reminded at that time the four of your former presidents two of them I know who they are one was George Washington the other was Abraham Lincoln and there are other two very godly presidents among your so many presidences that you have had so far so far only four godly ones and they are standing in the gap and praying for this nation and because of their tears and because of the sand the tear filled sand that is before the presence of God that George Washington prayed and dedicated this land to God he did not dedicate this land to Satan like what the president of Haiti did you know the president of Haiti dedicated the nation to Satan he, on the day of his inauguration he stood on the podium he lifted up in sand and said I dedicate this nation to Satan he said that that is why there's so much of voodooism all over the island of Haiti and that is the reason why 
God sent a powerful earthquake to judge that nation. But your nation is not like that. You have been dedicated unto the living God. That is why so many missionaries rose up from this nation. So many wonderful ministries rose up from this nation. And you have been a blessing. You have been like a lighthouse to the whole world. That's what you have been. But now, you have become a den of thieves. Now, you have become a den of witches and warlocks. They have more right than the Bible in the schools. Witchcraft is taught, but Bible is banned. Now what have you become? You have become a Babylon. Once upon a time you were Jerusalem. But now, God has raised up a Cyrus, a godly king, who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. He was instrumental to send Nehemiah back, Ezra back, say, go, build up Jerusalem, build up the temple, I will finance it. In the same manner, God has raised up Mr. Trump. You know, we need to overlook at all his weaknesses. The big mouth or small mouth? Overlook all them. Those are the little minuses in everybody's life. We all have weaknesses, don't we? We all of us, we have that. Irrespective of all that, if the grace of God can be upon you, why not upon him? Right? So please, I beg you one more time, on this last night, you must pray very much for your president. Set up a prayer watch. Pray for your president. Gather group together. If possible, fast and pray once a week. You must set up a 24-7 prayer watch all throughout his years of presidency. Now, listen. If he survives the four years, which means God's grace has been full upon this nation and that grace will continue for another four years. Amen. Not just grace, but the favor of God will shine upon this nation. The sun of righteousness will arise and shine upon this nation with wings of healings flapping all over this land and you will be restored back to your former glory. <laughs> Godly ministers will rise up one more time in this nation. Godly apostles Godly prophets will rise up in this nation one more time and set the church back on its right order, right feet. And righteousness will spring forth from this land. Truth, mercy and righteousness will all spring forth and grow up like the palm tree. And your land will become like a fatted cow, like Jashuran. And your land will truly become a land that flows with milk and honey. And nations will come to you, kings will come to you, princes will come to you, and you will nurse them, and you will teach them, and you will feed them, and you will show them the ways of God.
Now for all this to happen, you must bend your knees and pray for President Trump. Now pray that he will be surrounded with godly advisors. You now sometimes, for a neat sake, ungodly wrong people can come to office. So he should be surrounded with all godly advisors. All the secretaries must be godly people. Amen. So this should be your prayer focus. Some good things have already begun. There are regular prayers now going on in the White House. That's one good start. So when he took office, he has got rid of all the idols that Obama brought into the White House. The White House has become White House again. Amen. Amen. Number three. A third law will be enacted to exterminate an entire nation or an entire people group. This happened during the time of Esther. In Esther chapter 3 verse 6 to 14 you will read that a law was made to kill all the Jews living in the Persian Empire. So that means a worldwide law will be enacted to behead all those who refuse to take the mark of the beast. Which means the entire nation of godly Christians will be exterminated. Mark Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 and 17 and chapter 20 verse 4 now having heard about all this what must we do how to prepare ourselves for the coming persecution now this is the counsel of the Lord number one be prepared and be forewarned you have been forewarned right now Amen. now you must learn to prepare Number two, instead of feeling sorry and fearful about all what is going to come, rather Matthew chapter 5 verses 10 to 12 tells us you must count it a blessing. The early church practiced that. Acts chapter 4 verses 21 to 31 tells us when they were persecuted, they did not sit down and cry. They did not engage an uh, attorney to fight their case. They bent their knees and the whole church of 4,000 people lifted up their voices and prayed unto God. And the first sentence they said in their prayers, Lord, thank you for this privilege to suffer on your behalf. That was the first sentence in their prayer. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 tells us, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, now there is an escape route for you to escape from all persecution that's coming. I'm going to share this shortcut with you. But this is a secret. You must promise me that you will not reveal this to anybody else. Can I trust you? Okay, the secret is this. Don't live a godly life. If you don't live a godly life, you won't have persecution. Praise God. No, amen? All those who live godly lives will suffer persecution. So the only way you will escape persecution is don't live godly lives which you don't want to, right? Now, Philippians 
chapter 1 verse 29 says it's a great honor and privilege to suffer for the Lord Jesus number three stand firm and strong in your faith Luke 22 verses 31 to 32 tells us pray that your faith will be strong you must pray every day from now onwards that your faith will stand strong so that when the testing comes you will not buckle and fall down be patient in suffering guarding your faith Luke chapter 21 verse 19 number four be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 what does it mean to be strong to be strong means put your trust in the Lord God to deliver you and the second thing in the power of his might means have confidence in God's power to save you a good example of that is found in Daniel chapter 3 verses 17 and 18 where the three Hebrew youths in the face of persecution and being thrown into the fiery furnace told King Nebuchadnezzar if that is the case our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand O king now that is their faith statement and then they said but if not which means but if God doesn't save us let it be known to you O king that we do not serve your gods nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up you know why they said that their confidence was in God that he will protect them no matter what happens so that is putting your confidence in God number five be a praying church to handle persecution see that is this is another great missing thing in the churches today the churches are not praying churches so if you're not a praying church when the persecution comes you will fall as a church you will turn your back against God your church must become a praying church Amen. Acts chapter 12 verse 5 when Peter was put in prison the whole church prayed whole night for Peter there was a chain prayer made for him the whole day whole night until he was set free what we popularly do today is to engage a lawyer to fight your case or we file a petition in the court it will not work we are fighting against a losing battle because laws will be enacted against us your power lies on bended knees <laughs> number six endure suffering till the end of your last breath Matthew 24 verse 13 in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 the Lord Jesus said be faithful until death no matter what happens don't deny be faithful don't fear persecution nor your torturers now a counsel for you from the Lord Jesus two scriptures Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 the Lord Jesus says do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer do not fear indeed the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested that's the purpose of being thrown into prison for you to be tested and tried as gold and you will have tribulation for 10 days counsel number 2 Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 
because you have kept my command to persevere i also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth here the lord promises you that he will keep you now the word keep you in the greek means guard you from loss or injury by keeping you by keeping the eye of god upon you so you should pray like this lord keep me as the apple of your eye hide me under the shadow of your wings this should be your daily prayer psalms chapter 17 verse 8 in revelation chapter 3 verse 11 the lord jesus counsels you hold fast to what you have that no man may take your crown second timothy chapter 2 verse 12 says don't deny persevere in suffering now on the first day that i came to moravian falls and the lord spoke to me about this thing he also said this persecution will last for about 3 years so what should you do besides all this luke 21:36 the lord jesus teaches us that we should pray always to be counted worthy to escape from the coming tribulation Finally there was another thing the lord revealed to me that i never understood why he told me that or the greater importance of that until the first night that i preached here then i understood why the lord revealed that final point And the final final point was pray to be hidden now i will share this in greater detail tomorrow because that's a, a long subject what does it mean pray to be hidden i have never known this before and i don't know i didn't know why the lord spoke this until if you remember in the first night when i was praying i was shown about this moravian falls region then i understood what it means to be hidden the importance of this place why this place has been chosen by god and why and in this place god would reveal this word to be hidden let's stand up for a word of prayer oh before you stand up please sit down <laughs> one last word i almost forgot now please turn your bibles with me to the book of revelation chapter 12 the lord jesus told me to to tell you this and to call for your response to that revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 Shall we all read together? Yes. 1 2 3 Now look at the last phrase in the scripture. They love not their lives unto death. And the question the Lord told me to ask you is He said ask them will they consecrate themselves to me to the extent that they don't love their lives even unto death okay whatever is your answer kneel down right now you kneel down even those who are watching from your homes get up from your chairs and you kneel down right now 
they love not their lives unto death can you make that consecration can you say yes lord no 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 you don't don't that's now this is between you and your god you just open your mouth open your heart and you talk to the lord god you tell him your answer can you dedicate yourselves consecrate yourselves even unto death that your life doesn't matter to you your spouses don't matter to you your children don't matter to you nobody matters to you your very life your very existence doesn't matter to you only your loyalty to the lord jesus matters to you you are willing to give an undivided loyalty to the lord jesus you are willing to give undivided trust in the living god you are willing to obey god implicitly now open your heart and you talk to the lord jesus now i see a special mighty angel in our midst right now the very angel that was sent out during the days of ezekiel to put out a mark on those who sigh and mourn for the sins of the land all those of you who were sincerely now with all your heart with all your soul with all that is within you if you sincerely make this consecration this angel has been charged by god to put a mark on your heart to set you apart for the lord i see the lord jesus christ as a lamb in our midst right now i see a beautiful lamb pure white a small lamb about maybe 2 years old 2 feet in length and height meekness lowliness of mind and heart are the characteristics of the lamb that should be found in my people an attitude to lay down all is the hallmark of a lamb as i was willing to lay down my life for all for whom i came to redeem greater love hath no man than this that a man is willing to lay down his life for his brethren there is no greater honor than this that a person because of his love for his god is willing to lay down his life like a lamb that is brought to the slaughter they are willing to be slaughtered because of their love for their god you open your heart and you talk to the lord jesus pour out your heart now make a full consecration of yourselves you may not get another opportunity like this don't pray for your families just pray for yourselves each man 
for himself. Your wife can pray for herself. Your husband can pray for himself. Your children can pray for themselves. Each makes a consecration of himself. I see an, an altar and a cross on the altar before each and every one of you right now. Cast yourself on that altar. You say to the Lord, here I am Lord. Here is my life Lord. I cast myself on the altar. I put myself as a living sacrifice on the altar. I see a whirlwind towards the right, on the right side. It is outside this building, a whirlwind of the Lord that is forming and it's going to come into this church, bring forth a mighty work in this church. So dedicate, consecrate, lay your all on the altar, tear away your programs, tear away your ambitions, tear away your own plans for the future, tear them all and put it on the altar. You say with all your heart, Lord, it is no longer I that live, but Christ Jesus lives in me. And the life that I live, it's not I, but Christ Jesus lives in me. And I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Say that.